However, there is a bridge that we see what's happened in the past that we are coming back around today. And as I get into operating systems, you guys will start to explore that nothing under the sun's ever new. And this happens all the time with computers. We have some advanced topics that we thought about in the 40s that today we're only seeing possible with modern technology. And now we're starting to go back in time and re-explore these topics and implement them. See, back in the 40s, we had this enigma problem with World War II and the Germans communicating with each other through their U-boats, and we couldn't crack the code. And that made shipping any materials from New York to the UK or France problematic. Because you need to understand, a lot of the production was happening here over in the States. In fact, if I remember correctly, is it a Wego? There is a, uh, is it a uh, Lockheed Martin military installation? During World War II, that was a high-risk area because they were making a lot of the fighter planes and the missiles to go over and, you know, defeat the Nazis. So when we cracked this code, it sort of sparked the uh, information error. It sort of sparked the need for computers. So throughout that history, you guys learned about what? Grace Hopper, naval commander. She actually gave a presentation up at Corning. And what was wonderful about Grace Hopper was, well, not only the fact that she was a female admiral officer in the Navy and made herself ranked up there during some times where women weren't even considered an asset in military intelligence, but she was a pioneer in computers. And when she went to go explain something, she was really clear about it. And her issue was she wasn't a computer person. In fact, throughout the whole Navy, the way she made herself ranked was they wanted to give her a position just for some of the stuff that she was doing. And she said, no, I should earn it no different than somebody else would earn it in our discipline. And so one of the things that made her wonderful and why people enjoyed her so well is because she was very straight to the point, regardless of whether you're an admiral, an admiral or a, uh, you know, what do they call those boys on the, uh, I guess they're considered seamen. I was trying to avoid that, but yeah. Uh, uh, so she was interviewed by um, David Letterman like maybe 20 years ago. And uh, she was actually just giving him a hard time, you know, going back and forth, battering with his sense of humor. And she goes, so he goes, what made you so different? And what, how were you able to climb the ranks in uh, naval history for being a woman? And she goes, well, I'll tell you, I wasn't the smartest candidate, but I was the hardest working. And computers were just coming in because during that time we cracked the enigma and we were all wondering what can we do next and how could we establish security connections and he goes, well, could you give me an example? And she goes, well, a lot of the engineers had problems explaining what a nanosecond is. And today we have a problem understanding what exactly a nanosecond is. We measure computer performance in nanoseconds. And in fact, this is that old topic that we're exploring together today, which we call nanotechnologies. With nanomachines, it is quite possible that your generation could live to be thousands of years old. I know it seems very far-fetched, but think about it. What causes us to age? What's that, Trey? Breakdown of cells, all right? So if we could imagine homes that are like hundreds of years old, how are they able to last centuries? Just keep them going, refurbish them, and... They get fixed. Move, yeah. How do we fix a single cell when it breaks down? We can't. In today's medical technology, we cannot fix a single cell. In fact, when we try to treat cancer, that becomes the problem. We target an area, we bombard it with radiation, and then in that area, a lot of cells die, healthy or not. Correct? 
Well, with nanotechnologies, we can make these small little machines that we can inject into our blood system and hone in on those damaged cells and replace just that particular cell. If there's a clog in your blood vessel, no problem. A little nanoscopic machine can go in there, do some rotor rootering, cleaning out the uh, cholesterol, and opening up your bloodways. Non-invasive medical procedure. And those machines would live in through you since the moment you were born, because they will operate off your body heat. Now it gets scary. But the point is, is what is a nano? And so she was explaining to people back at the time what a nanosecond was. And she said a nanosecond is how long it would take electricity to travel through this cable. Now, folks, as you see this cable, it's pretty far. In fact, Adam, you can do me a favor, hold this end. Even with Adam holding this, and this is why this cable's been up here, Oh, I'm sorry, Adam, I should have uh, unraveled this. So as you guys can see, let's go over, watch yourself, Morgan, and Courtney, can you grab that cable for me? And there we go. And when do you want to take that cable? Actually, take the whole thing and pass it down to Tina. And Tina, pass it down to Trey. There we go. That's a nanosecond. Electricity can travel from here to there. Now, just to give you an idea, a billion times in one second. That's awfully fast, right? That's what we measure computer performance in. Okay, you guys can set it down and I'll grab it from you later. If somebody wants to roll it up, appreciate it. But that concept is what changed and what inspired us to think, what can we do with technology? I mean, you have to understand, at that time, we didn't have instant communications. We had telegraphs, but the telephone was a very, very rare item indeed. I mean, it only happened in the cities, if that. But the way we communicated with each other was through mail. And it took such a long time that they said, thank you, that using computers or electricity, we can transmit and communicate with each other from around the world in a matter of seconds. Seconds. At that time, they're used to a matter of months. And think about it. Look how much our society has changed from this waiting for months to hear word back from family members or whatever to waiting for seconds to getting emails to the point where every time you guys see me, it's like, did you get my email? If this was done 50 years ago, if that, you might have asked me, did you get my letter I sent in the mail? I'm like, nah, and then you'd be like, well, that's all right, because I sent it yesterday and you'll probably get it next week. Do you see that understanding? So here we are. We had all this ancient technology, these theories. We're revisiting them and we're applying them. And one of them is that concept called a mainframe. Did in that uh, PowerPoint, did they go over one of the other things that made Grace Hopper very famous? She coined the phrase debugging. As a programmer, you're quite familiar with debugging your code. In fact, today debugging is referred to a uh, code that goes awry, that doesn't act according to plan, if you will. As programmers, you understand that you create a script for the computer to follow. And that's all it is. It's not magical. You're just telling it step one, step two. You can think of it as like a recipe for a chef. Right? If the chef starts screwing up and the cake isn't rising because they're using baking powder and not baking soda, well, there's where you debug it. And you say, okay, I meant for you to do it this way, correct? Well, back in the day, especially when it came to mainframes, uh, debugging actually meant that. 
you would literally take bugs out of the computers. Because we had these huge mechanical relays. Computers that were size of the size, the size of this building, not this classroom, the size of this building, would catch malls in these mechanical relays. And as a result, electricity would not flow, and they couldn't process the zeros and ones. So they would have to go through these machines and literally debug them by removing insects from the mechanical relays. Today we're revisiting this concept of what a mainframe is, and we're creating them virtually within our own PCs. See, back in the day, mainframes were these huge, and still are today, we call them like web farmers, or sorry, web servers. Mm -hmm. Web farms, uh, or server farms, is what I really want to say. And that is, they're just a bunch of computers connected together to act as one big, giant, powerful machine, correct? And when we had these big, giant mainframes, they would literally take up a building. Eventually, it got smaller, and they would take up a room. And then off of them, we would have these nodes or terminals. And you'd be sharing time with these computers. In fact, you'd probably be executing a batch, and that is, before you would have access to the mainframe, you would go to a control unit, an operator, and you would hand them a card asking for time on their mainframe. Example might be, you're trying to crunch out how much energy or how much force is gonna be required to leave the Earth's atmosphere. Now that's all a computer does. It's just a big giant math, it's a big giant calculator. But they understood that the old mainframes were really slow and that we couldn't have you monopolize the time. You had mission critical problems. Then you might have had curiosity or everyday problems. Then you had some bogus theoretical situations. So you'd go to the controller or the operator. They would classify what type of problem you had. And then they would give you X number of hours or time. They might say, you're allowed to run your program at 1 o'clock in the morning. And they would anticipate that it should probably take the computer, oh, about eight hours to finish. The problem with this whole thing was the way we programmed these mainframes is we used punch cards. And if you made one little mistake, it could throw the whole thing off and you could lose time. So we have modernized this concept. We moved from mainframes using terminals <laughs> to PCs, or workstations is what we call them in the professional world. Now, I know this doesn't seem apparent or practical in today's uh, society, but we're going to be coming back around by the end of today's lecture to revisit this concept. The idea was to make computers so cheap, so affordable, that the everyday person could have it, hence the word personal computers. They never dreamed that personal computers would be nearly as powerful as computers that took up the size of buildings, but they are, and they're becoming extremely powerful. That's what we learned in the last five or six weeks the hardware that went into these machines to make them as powerful as they are today. So if the hardware is the muscle to a computer, then what do you think software is? The intelligence. Software gives the computer purpose, if you will. In fact, it's software that drives us to buy the hardware. An example is, how many people have a Blu-ray player? Why do you have a Blu-ray player? Because of the high definition, correct? Because you want to watch the movies as best as you can possibly get them, correct? Quality. So the movie, if, if you will, would be considered as the software dictated you going out there buying the Blu-ray player. Or the high definition TV. Would it make sense to buy a Blu-ray player on those old, big old TVs that weren't high definition, standard def? Doesn't make any sense for you guys to buy the 93 octane gas for your little moped, correct? 
It works just fine on 87. Why waste the money, correct? Doesn't make sense for you guys to buy a high definition player for a television that doesn't support high definition. But this is an example that how software drives us. By the way, on a little side note, this is why I believe Blu-rays and optical discs are on their last leg out. I don't have to constantly buy a new player every time Hollywood comes out with better technology that makes the movies look better. Correct? USB has been around for a long time. It's very universal. So if it can be stored on a flash drive and I can plug it into my TV, regardless whether my TV can handle ultra high definition, that's the new thing, 2K, or not, I didn't have to go out and buy a new player, correct? So something to think about. So software comes in two categories or two forms. System and applications. Apps are intriguing, and this is why when we were talking about it a couple weeks ago, we were getting into like the Androids and the iOS devices, and I believe it was you, Josh, that said something like, you prefer the Android application or the Android platform because of there's more free apps for that particular platform. Is that consistently true? Are you guys finding that to be true? I think I like it more because it's more Windows-based than the iPhone. I think they run off two different... Android runs on like a Microsoft type of... I want to go, we'll talk about what makes the Android and what makes the iOS and what makes these. In fact, that's exactly what system software is. One of the most popular forms of system software is called your operating system. In fact, the Droid or the Android operating is an operating system, just like the iOS uh, OS operating system. Uh, no different than the Windows Mobile or Windows. In fact, when it comes to PCs, you guys are familiar with Windows. We also have OS X. We also have Linux. Use what? What's that? What's that, Trey? Linux? Oh, yeah. In fact, it's actually doing the opposite. It's becoming extremely popular. Has, has anybody in this classroom played around with Linux? Yeah, case in point. Uh, if I would have asked that a few years ago, nobody would have looked at it. What makes Linux so unique? It's like the badass when it comes to operating systems compared to like Windows and OS X. I, I guess you can say all the dorks and the nerds use it. Now, uh, yeah, a lot of Hackers, if you will, might prefer that environment or the Unix environment versus a Windows or an OS X. And what might be the reason why? It's open. And when I say it's open, I'm not referring to a door being open or closed. Um, we have to admit, as you guys are business people, uh, the reason why we're in business is to make money, correct? And, and, and think about it. If you guys would walk to like, oh, I don't know, Outback or Red Lobster, uh, they have those biscuits that everybody seems to love at Red Lobster, correct? And you say, could I have that recipe? What do you think Red Lobster would say to you? Yeah, go to hell. That's not happening. Why would they tell you to go to hell? It's not happening. Because if you can make it at home, <laughs> you can sell like Girl Scout cookies, right? They do now, yeah, yeah. And, and and why is that? Because people aren't eating out anymore or they need to make another re revenue of money? I mean, because that's been a, probably a long, heated argument at that corporation. Should we let it go? I mean, Olive Garden started letting go their salad dressing and their croutons. So now the question becomes is, if that's the only thing that drives me to your restaurant, why should I go, correct? Likewise. We have this open philosophy and this closed philosophy, or proprietary. Uh, Windows and OS X are proprietary operating systems. They are closed. You cannot look at the source code. In fact, this Thursday we'll be writing a small little program, and you'll see what a program, how a program comes to life using a programming language. The fact that you look at that code means that it's open. 
You can read it. It's in a, what we call a high level language. It's not in English, but it's also not in machine language. It's not in those zeros and ones that we've been talking about, right? So open source means that anybody who knows what they're doing could read the code, change it, modify it, and redistribute it. Why would somebody want to change the code? What's that? Yeah, but why would they want to do the modifications? What would it serve them? For the same reason why Android, <coughs> Google, used the Linux platform to create their operating system. So they can tailor it to meet their needs. A full-blown PC operating system requires a lot of processing power, right? Because it requires a lot of processing power, they're not usually friendly for de devices that run off of batteries. In fact, when you look at a laptop, and if you want an eight-hour battery, about a third of the weight in that laptop or the size of that laptop is the battery. A third. Nobody doesn't want a phone that weighs a ton or that comes out to here when you're, ta when you're talking on it because of the battery, correct? So they modified the operating system so it handles a special purpose, like touch interface, like phone communications, right? Things that you hardly see in today's PCs. I know things are changing, and we'll get into that. But an open environment, such as Linux, is free. You guys can download Linux. You can tailor it or have somebody else tailor it so it runs on your PC. In fact, those uh, nerds, hackers, or whatever you want to call them, made a version of Linux to get it to run on PlayStation 3. And for a short period of time, you guys could install an operating system on your PlayStation 3 and make it a computer. Because remember, we talked about the hardware. What makes a device a computer? Input. The PlayStation has USB ports. So you guys could hook up a USB keyboard and a USB mouse, right? So that, can't, that covers the I-O, I'm oh, sorry, the I. Then you have the P, then you have the O, right? Let's talk about the output, your television screen. Seems to be pretty natural, correct? So now let's talk about the P. The PlayStation has a central processing unit, it's an IBM cell processor. Also has memory. Remember, you can't have one without the other. So if you have a processor, you have memory. But what made the PlayStation 3 or what made the Xbox unique than what Nintendo had going for it? They have hard drives. So somebody hacked it, installed Linux on it, and from that point on, people can install software and use their PlayStation as a computer. And trust me, for $300, what a steal. So that's what you get by having an open source operating system that the community from all over the world can look at the code, modify it, and custom tailor it to meet the needs. By the way, if you are the type of person that, oh, I don't know, practices in unethical behavior when it comes to computers, you know, like write viruses or try to hack people's bank accounts, would you want to use an operating system that's more prone to get the virus that you wrote? Or an operating system that's less prone to be affected by the damage that you caused? So this is why I never could understand bio warfare. You want to write a virus, like a super flu, to wipe out a population that's on another continent. Do you realize that we're all the same? That is, we're all humans? or comprise the same genetic material, if you will. So if you write a virus that's going to affect somebody else in some other country, are you not afraid that it's going to blow back and affect you and your country? Isn't that a fear? So I never understood that. And that's what happens with computers. Windows, very popular. Um, however, the problem with Windows is it used to be, well, I guess in some regards still is, uh, very prone for security flaws. That is viruses, malicious wares, or threats. And why is that? Why would Windows over these other three operating systems be more prone 
they're having uh, security issues. You think Microsoft doesn't pay those people enough? I mean, Windows, Microsoft, their programmers get paid a lot of money. Uh, Linux, uh, those programmers don't make any money. Everything runs on Windows. Yeah, it's like, is there something wrong with Americans since we're the ones that are always bullied? Or we're doing the bullying versus some uh, third world country that you don't even know where it's <laughs> located at? Uh, there's a thing that has to be said about popularity, correct? If you're writing a virus and the majority of the world runs off of a particular operating system, would you want to write it for that operating system or the 1%? You get any idea? So yeah, Windows is known for their security flaws. That's because everybody and their mother is exploiting those flaws. Correct? The problem that people have with Microsoft is their lack of testing their products. At least that's what it used to be. They used to treat consumers as their test bed subjects. That is, go ahead and buy our Windows Millennium or Windows Vista. If you bitch long enough, we'll pull it off the shelf and we'll give you a new version. Correct? How many people had Windows Vista? What did you think of it? Still have it. Still have it. Works, fine. <laughs> Works fine for you? <laughs> a lot of updates, though. And Windows was, Microsoft was trying a new technology, and every time they seem to try a new technology in their operating system, which is why I've been holding very resistant to going on to Windows 8, it seems like they want the public to try it out first. And then if they have a problem with it, they learn from these mistakes, and then they release products like Windows 7. Now, in my opinion, out of all the other Windows that's been out there, uh, I didn't jump to Windows Vista because I was fixing everybody's computers that had Windows Vista. So I went from Windows XP to Windows 7. And I enjoy Windows 7. I think they have actually a good solid operating system. But how were they able to do that? Well, their philosophy was, let's see what the problems they're having with it. We'll document those problems, and then we'll make them better for Windows 7, right? The other thing that happens is, and they are changing it. In fact, when Windows 7 first came out, they put it through a lot of beta testing. And that's the thing we'll talk about on uh, Thursday's class. When you develop a product, what are the steps to get it out there? You guys are business people. Eventually, you're going to have to weigh this. Do you still keep this product in-house that's going to become obsolete tomorrow? And you can test the shit out of it, but never make any money off of it because we're on to the next biggest thing, right? Or do we say, well, we know it's got some bugs, but it's, at its core, workable. And today, we look back at it with the internet, and releasing an update costs the company nothing versus what it used to you'd have to send them out floppies or CDs, correct? So Windows is popular. Yes, is prone to security, but it's not the only operating system that is prone for security flaws. But why or what made Windows so popular? By the way, through your history thing that you guys learned, it wasn't what made Microsoft, correct? In fact, this is the reason why Windows has become popular. What made Microsoft? What did Microsoft release? And by the way, at that time, it was like uh, Bill Gates and Paul uh, Allen. Thank you. It was just. The OS DOS or MS DOS? They made MS DOS, MS DOS for IBM, but that's not what their first product was. Was it basic? Basic. It's exactly what it was. In fact, you guys will be using some variation of basic this Thursday. All right, and we're going to try to download, install it, and then actually write our own little software. Software we're going to write, well, majority of it will all be written for you, is going to be create, uh, converting binary numbers to decimal. But nevertheless, um, BASIC. BASIC is a programming language. And that's what, you got to remember, back in the late 70s, early 80s, there wasn't that much out there, software-wise. And think about it. What drives your uh, smartphones? One, it's got to look sexy. I'll give you that. Second, it's got to have a nice battery life, correct? But more importantly, it's got to be fun. 
I mean, how many people you know bought some kind of touch device to play Angry Birds? Whether well, it was an iPhone, an Android, and wasn't that the big deal that, oh, it's coming to the Android or it's coming to the iPhone? And it's free on this platform, but you gotta pay $3 on that platform? The fact is, software gives our hardware purpose. And what made Windows so popular is there are millions and millions of applications out there. And why are there millions of applications? Because the very first thing Microsoft gave us was an easy programming language. Now, if you're Microsoft, and your next logical thing to do is to create an operating system so your programs can run, wouldn't you want to make your operating system friendly to run all those programs built from like the late 70s on up? And that's exactly what happened. And that's why the business world jumped all over Windows. Because when you guys go out there, you realize that you got to keep your recipes hush hush. You can't just sell them. You can't just leave them out there for anybody to get them because you'll put yourself out of business, correct? And with that being said, you realize that your company offers something unique that no other company offers, whether it's a product, a service, or efficiency to make your product cheaper gives you a, an advantage, correct? Because you know if you can make your product cheaper, more people will be likely to buy it. Or if you can make your product better. We good about that? So how do you do that? How do you use today's technology to make products more efficient, fully functional, and cheaper? That's where you see people like me. You look at software. You try to get an application out there that meets the needs of your consumers or your employees. Let me give you an example. I've been teaching Microsoft Office since 1995. It's been through a lot of revisions. Now, in 95, I was teaching on a one-to-one -one basis. By 2003, I think that was one of their variations, those versions that they came out with, I was teaching it in the classroom. And what I found was there was always this next level of knowledge. I mean, everybody probably used some form of word processing. So you guys probably know, without even having to go through a book, how to bold some text, how to underline it, how to italicize it, and even how to print it, correct? In fact, I'm willing to argue that if you don't know those skills, that should become part of a common skill set, like a prereq, if you will. So in 2003, when we were teaching this stuff, it was always hard because I was getting a lot of non-traditional students in the classroom who didn't grow up with word processing software. We good about that? And so as an instructor, you're always faced with this problem. How can you teach so that the majority of the class is benefiting it? so that you guys are still walking away with something that you didn't know, and then the other end of the spectrum is not falling behind because they feel it's too far above them. We clear about that? And so maybe four years ago, five years ago, a company came out with a piece of software to handle this problem, and you guys are using that today. It's not the only type. There's other companies that come out with that, and it's not perfect, but I promise you, compared to what we taught back in 2003, that was 10 years ago, you guys probably prefer this method. And that is using My IT Lab. What does My IT Lab allow you guys as students to do versus you couldn't have done being in a classroom like here? You learn at your own pace. You learn what you need to know and nothing more, correct? Or what you, what you don't already know is what I should say, correct? when it works. And it's not perfect, I agree. But somebody had to develop code, if you will, that addresses this issue, this special case scenario. Because trust me, not everybody benefits by using my IT lab. While as developers working for big corporations, we know that we're big enough that we start having internal struggles, if you will. 
So we create departments. Like HR, you will never find an HR department at a mom and pop shop. Why not? To table things on a personal level. Uh, it's too damn cost ineffective to have HR for only a few employees. And typically mom and pop shops are usually family oriented. So what does HR do for a big corporation? Which is sort of funny because HR costs a company a lot of money. But does the cost justify the benefits? Or, or, sorry, does the benefits justify the cost? There we go. Morgan says yes. You guys are business people. I think when the beginning of the semester, the majority of you guys said you're in some form of business. So tell me, because I could give a shit about HR. I could give shit about business. It's not my forte. How does HR benefit? How can a company? And when do you know, when you've been working for a company that's growing, is the time to implement human resources? They're negotiators and they push policy. That's what they push or create policy because typically managers will push or implement policy, correct? They make sure everyone's following the policy. Though. Okay. Everybody's properly trained. They, they are aware of the policies. Okay. What else do they do? Like I said, negotiating. Negotiating, so they, maybe they can save the employer some money if there's a union or whatever. Or when they're hiring people, they determine contracts. Morgan? So if they hire shitty employees, garbage in is garbage out, right? But wait a minute. If I'm a mom and pop shop and I've owned my company and I have a lot of care and I'm this higher up person, if you will, that started at the bottom, wouldn't I be better suited to handpick my employees? If you have a hundred stores, you can't go from store to store to store to store and hire all your employees. When I start delegating and giving out and expanding and I realize that I can't be in multiple places at the same time, I need many of me. But more importantly, I need a part of me that did the hiring to do the hiring for the other, other places, correct? and that they should be good at what they do, and that's the only thing that they do. This is the whole Adam Smith philosophy, right? Okay. So at what point? 50 employees? 50 stores? 100 stores? When do we justify that? And HR is not the only service that actually doesn't contribute. Well, inadvertently they do. And ultimately, you should look at the stakeholders and say that, in of ultimately, everything comes down to this one thing, correct? Like at a college level, our mission statement is students are the focus of all that we do here, correct? And that anything in a business should focus back to their mission statement. Otherwise, what purpose do you have? And if you need to change your mission statement, you're changing your business plan, you're changing your structure, correct? So, what other departments? Well, the one I'm trying to get you guys to drive at is obviously the IT department. They are a huge cost for a company. In fact, they're very disgruntled. They, have, they lack personal skills, or what we call soft skills. Translation, typically IT people are assholes. They're enough to piss you off to make you counterproductive than to be productive. And the reason why they can get away with that is because of what? They know more than you. Good what they do in your the heart and soul of a company now is stored in a digital format. In fact, in the information age, information is king. And if you don't pay me enough, I will sell your secrets to the next company. What's happening in our society in corporate America? Our managers lack the technical know-how, nor the desire to actually understand or want to understand how computers function and what problems they can cause an organization. 
just like me. I'm not a business person. I could care shit about HR. I don't even know how they function and what they do. I know they offer a service. And as long as that service is making us efficient employees at that business and everybody gets along just well and there's very minimum resistance inside, then let's keep them. But if they're not doing their job, ax them, right? Well, we have to look at the IT people. And for the reason why you guys take this course, because from here on out, that hardware stuff, now nah, you're just going to buy something that you can afford and you'll be happy with it. And when it starts acting funny, you'll throw it away and buy something new. Disposable computers, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper. How often do you guys go through a phone? Every two years. But this stuff, this stuff's intangible. This stuff is actually the heart, as I said, the heart and soul of an organization. Yeah. It's not really the software or the operating system, but really the applications. The applications are the tools that allow you guys to do your work. And these tools are constantly evolving. I mean, they're changing all the time, especially with the advent of the internet and how we're talking about connecting computers together that we say to ourselves, is there any way I can do this at home? Sure. But well, we're going to need to make sure you have these software and that you're connected through the security, uh, sorry, this encrypted connection. All stems off of software. And we start looking at it, and what typically happens as a manager or even as a common employee, you got to say to yourself, is there a better way? That's what we've asked for the last 10 years. Is there a better way to teach them the office applications? I don't know. You guys will tell me at the end of the semester when we start doing the integration stuff, when I start teaching you the applications themselves, well, we're not going to be using my IT lab. Tell me which way you prefer. We are human, and by definition, we are social creatures. We need human contact. I teach an online class for this section. They're not getting this personal time, if you will. Even though I record my lectures, it's not capturing the energy in the room. And I know right now the energy is pretty low. I understand that. That's what you get by being in the presence of somebody. When it's online, the energy is always low. You have to be self-motivated. It's not fascinating. It's not engaging. I don't ask you guys to stand, sit when you're sitting at home watching this video. But here... We start going back into what a business and how a business operates is no different than how a computer operates. We understand that the basic computer needs one of these four popular operating systems to be installed. Why? You could think of an operating system as being the general manager of a company. Now, some of you may be experienced this. But I know eventually you will all experience this. And that is, every year the company's going to come out with some kind of goals, something to attain, whether it's cheaper uh, productions or more efficient uh, services or whatever the case may be. You're going to establish that. And you might be in a meeting and you guys are going to be bouncing ideas on how to acquire that. 9% of the time is going to be falling back onto the computer. But the key here is you're going to have this central coordinator. I don't know how you want to say it. The general manager, your boss. And they're going to have objectives. They're going to have goals, their duties, their responsibilities. Basically, is to get as much as they possibly can out of you with paying you as little as possible. So some of the things they're going to have to manage, if you will, It's going to be the processor. We said earlier when we did a review that the processor was the brains of our computer, correct? You can think of the processor as being you, the worker, and that your boss, your operating system, is going to have to coordinate this. What do you think is going to happen to you? And by the way, the saying goes, what's the reward for success? More work. 
See, like I said, eventually when you guys get into corporate America, you will see all this stuff happening. The greater you are at doing your job, the more likely you're going to be doing more work, correct? If you're an operating system or you're a manager, your deal is, hey, I need to get this done as soon as possible. Who do I go to? The one that gives me less shit, very productive, and is good at what they do, correct? But what's going to happen if your manager takes abuse of you, overworks you? That's when you start showing your fangs and we go down to HR. We start looking at your job description and say, look, you need to pay me more or hire somebody else, correct? We try to get away with as little as possible and then eventually we overwork because we start seeing that things start to grow. And then we say, okay, we've reached a point and now we need another employee, correct? This is where HR comes in. That's what happens with the processor. The operating system has to coordinate all the different transactions that are going through there. We talked about one technique. In fact, this technique came in three categories. One, time sharing. Two, pipeline or hyperthreading. And three, multitasking. Time sharing was simply this, one washer, one dryer, and when they got done, you are allowed to do the next thing, correct? You couldn't use the washing machine to do two, two loads of laundry at the same time. You have to wash one load and then do the next, correct? So you had to wait your turn. And so when you guys have multiple applications running on your computer, each of them have to wait their turn. Now, when I began this conversation, I told you this is what a nanosecond is in length, correct? What if I told you that each operating system might determine that a program is allowed one millisecond of time? I couldn't even say the letter A in a millisecond. But for some applications, that's eternity. That'd be like 60 years for us. Because the faster that the CPU can function, right, the more they can get done in a fraction of time. I mean, the same is true about cars. The faster your car can go, the more feet it covers in a second. We good about that? So applications are just a bunch of instructions. How do the instructions get processed or manipulated? That's where the operating system tells the processor, here's your code, do your magic, do your thing. The quicker it can get done, the quicker each application can have attention from the processor. So we do this round robin thing. We say you got a millisecond, you got a millisecond, you got a millisecond, you got a millisecond. Now to me, a millisecond, gosh. I know you guys are thinking I wish a class was a millisecond long. And I know I'm wishing a week was only a millisecond long and my weekends were like centuries long. But it's all about relativity. Obviously, if we can mix this technology with this technology, and pipelining would be the thing about jamming your laundry through a tube, if you will, and it first goes to the washing machine, and then the next step is it goes to the dryer, correct? And then as you keep on jamming laundry down, the, uh, down this pipeline, it, it's getting processed like a factory worker on assembly line. We good about that? The dryer has its role. The... Uh, the, the laundry machine has its role. I know, I'm tongue -tongue. the washing machine has its role. Well, that's what happens in pipelines. We recognize that the processor has different departments. So if I'm working on a project, I can say, let's get a team together. In fact, this is what employers tell us all the time when they come back to us. We need more group projects. In fact, in a couple more weeks, I'll be unlocking your group project. The reason why you guys do group projects throughout school, because I think they're a bunch of bullshit, there's a bunch of whining caused from it, and a bunch of headaches from group projects. You guys been through group projects? You guys know what I'm talking about? You get some people that do the work, and you get a bunch of other people that don't do the work? Yeah. This is what happens here, too. That when you get into corporate America or any other country, they're going to designate the labor. 
and they're going to get a group together, and they're going to divide it, and they're hopefully going to put specialty people in this group, like a computer person, like a project manager, like a business analyst, maybe a marketing person, maybe an accountant. And they're all going to have their, they're all, they're all going to have their each special role of responsibility. But this is why people should go out and get their MBAs so they can get paid a little bit more. Your group is only as effective as your leader. If your leader does not know how to utilize every member in their group, then the group fails. Then it becomes inefficient. If your leader is out there to please somebody, then they're going to go to the one that always nods their head and agrees and does the work. Then they are to the pain in the ass that says, I'm not doing that. Right? We all look for the path of least resistance. So when it comes to your group projects, make sure you guys have an effective leader. Don't vote the leader in because they look attractive and they're easy to get along with. In fact, do the quite opposite. They are a pain in the ass, they're go-getters, and they know what resources they have to work with. When you go to compare operating systems, how they manage the processor ultimately dictates the performance of your machine. If the operating system fails to recognize the different features that the CPU has and how to coordinate or load the pipe up with work, then you're still resorting back to time sharing. And time sharing is really ineffective. Could you imagine when you guys are in your group and you say, look, we're not going to be able to do step two unless Adam gets his step one done. What does step two have to do with Adam? No, I don't know. It's just easy for me to understand one thing at a time. All right, it's easy for you to understand one thing at a time, but guess what? You only have so many, time, uh, so many days to get this project done. If you're waiting on Adam before you do step two, step three, step four, guess what's going to happen to your project? Yeah, and you're going to look like an ineffective leader. So then we get to this concept called multitasking, right? We take the larger task, the larger project, and we divide it up. In fact, your group is probably just one task that the company has going on. And they have other ones. This is why your managers report to managers above them, correct? Because they know that their ultimate goal, like our goal right now, is to retain students. Our FTEs are low. Maybe the economy is getting better. Who knows? But the higher-ups are just looking at that number, and they're saying that FTEs are really low. Now they go to like middle management. They talk to different people in different departments, and they say, what do you think your department can do to achieve this goal? Emissions might say offer scholarships. Factoring might say um, we need to offer online distant learning. We need to offer uh, more blended environments so that the students can still keep their job and come to us like evening classes. You getting the idea here, folks? So when it comes to multitasking, that's when you have multiple computer uh, applications running at the same time on your computer. In order for that to happen, you have to have two or more cores, right? These two, you can have one core. Remember the core is the control unit in ALU, right? Remember the control unit fetches the instructions and the data. We good about that? And a single core, they can only process an instruction at a time. They do it really fast, but nevertheless, it's an instruction at a time. So when we look at this, the processor is being coordinated by the operating system, which the operating system's taking the application and passing the instruction to memory. The control unit goes to memory, grabs the instruction and the data that needs to be manipulated, and sends it back. With the pipeline, they might be able to take two threads of the same task. A thread's like wash and dry. The task, laundry. Does that make sense? And multi, sorry, multitasking, you need at least two core processors to get it so that both tasks run at the same time. 
If I were to show you the architecture of a computer, the modern day computer looks like this. This is two cores. We have one core right here, and then we have another one right over here. This might be attending your word processing needs, and this one right here, your web browser. Both applications have their own set of instructions on how to process the data. They both produce different results, correct? You use a web browser to browse the World Wide Web to look at web pages. You use a word processing software to type a paper out. They can be done now simultaneously without your computer having a hiccup. And what does that mean? It means as an employer, you guys can get your work done faster. But what's the problem? I'll be honest, I can only do one thing at a time. I cannot be using my web browser while I'm word processing. It could be open, but can you guys take your single mouse and click on a hyperlink while you're trying to highlight text in a Word document? No. So wait a minute. Most of the time, the operating system's waiting on you. In fact, the picture that I give you, remember we had the whole IPO? Well, this is what it looks like when it comes to the operating system. You, the user, interact with the operating system, and the operating system handles the hardware and the software. You have to tell the operating system to do this to the software. In fact, the operating system provides you with a user interface. Sometimes, most of the time, it's a graphical user interface, which we call GUI. But that's not the wave of the future. The wave of the future, when it comes to it, is a natural language interface. Or just simply a natural interface. And you guys are already using one of those. It's the way you learned when you were a kid. Touching. And look at our devices now. They're all touch-oriented, if you will. So when we look at this, you, the user, has to tell the operating system to go fetch the software. The operating system will load it into memory and then tell the CPU that in memory you have some code waiting to be manipulated. But once again, I have to go back to this whole using multiple cores. Yes, it's great having programs, multiple programs running at the same time. An example is like watching a movie or listening to music. How many people are doing that while they're browsing the web or doing their word paper? And so maybe in your word, sorry, your web browser, you have Pandora running. Correct? Now that data has to be processed without your involvement. We need to take those zeros and ones and produce sound waves from them. Those zeros and ones are highly compressed so they can travel over the internet. Hence, they're going to require a lot of processing attention. Would you watch or listen to music if it kept on causing every time you're typing a letter five minutes for the letter to appear? No. So now the question becomes, as computers are becoming more and more faster, this cycle, if you will, this process, becomes transparent. So as programmers, we say, let's start using these cores for more than one thing. And look what's happening to our applications. They're coming more and more intelligent, more and more useful. Case point. in point, the original, the original word processor, processor did not did check, not check grammar. grammar. And to do a spell check, you actually had to execute a separate program. All right? Now, you guys probably didn't use WinStar, something back in the 80s, but probably in the 90s, you probably used Microsoft Word. And in that time, 95, Microsoft Word released Auto Grammar and Spell Check. 
And it was like a godsend for anybody that had always ran, uh, always typed in run on sentences. Because you get a little green squiggly mark underneath the sentence, correct? Letting you know that, hey, you might want to check the sentence out because you might have a verb in the wrong place or it might be a run on or it's a fragment. Now that feature would not be used or was not used in the 80s because if it would do it automatically, every time I type in something, it would take me forever to do it. Nowadays, we look at it and we say, what else can we do with word processing? We can pretty much put it to bed, correct? We can insert pictures, even video files and word processing documents, tables, we can format columns, we can do professional publishing from Microsoft Word. What else do you guys want from your word processor? This is where you say, wouldn't it be nice if it could do and fill in the blank. What do you guys want your word processing to do, your word processor to do? Write my papers for me, you got it. Exactly right. Now, tell me, how do you write a paper? How does that work? Maybe if you gave your word processor like ideas that you're thinking of, it would structure them and... I'm not looking for a solution in this. I want to know what, how do we write papers? How do we do our research? How do we even, I mean, the idea of writing a paper should be to relay a thought, an idea, right? To communicate something. We good about that? And don't tell me, no, it's because my asshole instructor, my English instructor told me I had to do it because it's, you know, my, it's worth 80% of my final grade. Well, the reason why you have to do it here is so we can get you ready so that when you leave here, you guys can communicate your thoughts in a more intelligent manner, okay? So tell me, guys, what do you think it would take for your word processor to be able to do your own research, conduct your own papers? Artificial intelligence? What is intelligence? We would first have to define, correct? And when we get down this path, because we will explore AI uh, probably next Tuesday, I have a bunch of videos, it's cool as shit. Uh, I'll tell you, it's really the stuff that we are doing today. In fact, AI was a concept developed back in the 40s, like I was telling you guys, but we did not have the processing tension or power to actually do it. In fact, I always like to tell my students, you need to watch the movie Blade Runner. And it's a perfect example of this. Back in the 40s, we had the father of computer science, Al, sorry, Alan Turner, or Turning, Turning, and he developed this test because this was the fear that if computers can become so intelligent or powerful, someday we won't be able to determine whether they are man or machine. And the way they would do this is they would have a wall like that. And behind that wall, there would be either a person or a machine. And you as the contestant, if you will, or as the scientist, would ask a question. You'd get a response from whatever's beyond that wall. And within that response, you have to determine whether or not this person's a human, or this thing is a human or a machine. And so the movie Blade Runner, they're basically implementing that. They're drilling these uh, life forms, if you will, because you know obviously in the movie they're just humans. But the concept of the story is you don't know if they are humans or if they're androids, because they display a level of intelligence that you and I wouldn't be able to determine the difference. So they ask a series of questions. And through those series of questions, they ultimately have to determine whether they should be executed or if they should live. So it comes down to it. What is intelligence and how do they function? 
Well, today's computers, they are so powerful enough that we are advancing like you wouldn't believe in this realm. In fact, big corporations are using artificial intelligence. You will get to a topic called management information systems. And in this topic, we're talking about database-driven stuff. Let me ask you something. How many people opened up or turned on the weather channel or opened up the weather page before they came to class today? Two, three? Why did you guys do that? Mitch, why did you do that? Have it? OK. <laughs> Behavior. That's predictable. All right? Tina, did you say you raised? You, OK, why did you do it? Oh, so you're just seeing if class was going to be canceled. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Father, it was safe to drive. So you needed some information to make a decision, correct? Now think about what we did. You accessed this place that stored data. It was only data, because I personally could give a shit whether it was going to snow or not, because I had to be at work, right? So to me, it was irrelevant. I don't bother checking. I just get up and go. Now, some days I'm wearing a sweater when it's 70 degrees out because I failed to check the weather, right? But typically I'm safe until like, what, April, May, around this area? Gosh, where I'm from, March 21st was always spring, and it, for some reason it always hit 70 and stayed that way until June. Here, it snows in the end of freaking May. And so maybe I should get in the habit of checking the weather channel a lot better, but I don't. But a lot of you guys do to make decisions. This is a place that has huge resources available for them, whether it's satellites, thermometers from all over the globe, telling them that the weather's going to be like this today. Here's the interesting thing. They are predicting. They can't promise me that at 3 o'clock it's going to snow today, right? But they are predicting it. And out of the last 10 years or so, what do you think the results have been like? Are you guys been pleased with the weather? The weather, the weather channel, the webpage? What's that, Morgan? They're getting, they're getting better. Has anybody ever asked why they're getting better? I mean, now they're giving you guarantees to like up to three degrees. Better technology? What they have done is collected masses and massive amounts of data, not only today, but for the last hundreds of years. They put it in this big, giant warehouse, something that would take us centuries to be able to read through it and make correlations, right? Active intelligence is when you put your hand in a fire, you are going to feel what? Yeah, it's going to hurt. Now, the definition of an idiot is somebody that keeps on doing it and expects what? Different results. But think about your intelligence. I could never teach you guys what heat feels like. Admit to me. You've all in one time in your life have touched something that was extremely hot. And you know what? You've probably done that many times over. But was it the same damn thing each time? If not, if, if so, come see me after class. We have to talk about your academic standings. <laughs> but no, I mean, if you saw a flame, maybe you're curious. And maybe you touched it and you learned, ouch, you'll never do that again because of how much pain it caused. But that was that correlation. You see this item and you associate it with something. This is why some of you are screwed up about tasting certain foods. Like I have a friend that will never eat at McDonald's because when she was a kid, she got food poisoning and forget about it. I'm like, the hamburger's different now and all this stuff's coming out. Now. She's like, no way, I'm not touching that. You know, because sometimes we associate these psychological things. Likewise, a computer's becoming so powerful that they can dig through all this information that on this day, these things happened. The moon was here, the sun was there, the tidal waves were up, the wind was blowing in this direction, the temperature was this, and every other thing out there. And they said, 
with all these all added up, we have a 99% chance that the weather's going to be snowing at 3 o'clock today. Intelligence. We'll explore that next Tuesday. We're going to cover the other six topics uh, this Thursday in class. I will see you guys then. Take care.